Hey, what's up everybody? Halsey here with VFX Apprentice, and today we're going to be going over the building blocks of visual effects. That's textures, meshes, and shaders. Oh my, what the heck are they? How are they made? How are they used? And what role do they play in visual effects development? Well, we're going to be going over all of that, so let's get right into it. So, textures, what are they? Well, we can think of them as the first building block of our effect. They're the pretty pictures that we see at the beginning. And when it comes to textures, there's several different kinds that we use for various purposes, which we'll get into shortly. But the big takeaway is that an effect is often composed of many textures, not just one. Uh, now, what we're seeing here in this example is a completed effect, this very beautiful fiery explosion with this fiery ring that's coming out of it. Very cool. But let's break down some of the visuals into their base components. Now, here uh, I've taken out four of the sort of main textures that are being used. These aren't all the textures, but these make up the majority of the effect. So starting off, we have a core flash, which happens right there in the beginning. And then we have this soft glow texture for our sparks. Now, both of these are non tileable textures and they're pretty straightforward. They give us the basic shape of our visual and we can modify their size to be as big or as small as we need them to be. Next up, we have a special texture called a flip book. And this allows us to play an animation that we've embedded within the texture itself. And it plays sequentially from left to right, top to bottom. And finally, for this example, we have a tiled texture we're using for the fiery ring here. And tiled textures are quite common, and we use them whenever we need a visual that repeats or moves indefinitely, either left or right, up or down, or a combination of those directions. For an effect like this one, we can see that there's no single texture that drives the whole effect. Instead, it's a combination of all of these elements working together that give us the composition. And you'll notice that the textures we've been looking at are all black and white. That's most commonly the case for these types of textures, but not always. And that's because we can adjust things like the color and opacity within the particle system, which we'll talk more about later. So far, we've covered some of the most commonly used textures, but there are some others that are definitely worth mentioning. For instance, there are special textures called noise patterns. We can think of these as a random but organized mess that helps us emulate the chaotic patterns found in nature. They're commonly used in effects, but they're often not meant to be the star of the show, like that core flash or the flip book we saw previously. Instead, they work behind the scenes as a supporting element. And we use these kinds of textures to add or subtract layers to create more visual interest in our effects. Similar to noise patterns are erosion maps. And just like the other textures we looked at, these are also black and white images. And again, they're not meant to be the star of the show necessarily. They drive the uh, sort of the motion within that texture. If we want it to fade out in a very interesting way, we can use an erosion map to dissolve the visual away instead of fading it uniformly. And next, I'd like to talk about flip books because uh, we talked about them earlier. And uh, to a complete beginner, they can look a little strange. They're almost like textures within a texture. Well, those are the different frames of an animation that have been uh, sort of shrunk down to an appropriate size to fit within a grid within that texture. And then we can feed that into our engine that we're using, and it can read each of those frames as if it were an animation. We can play that over a frame rate to get the actual animation that we're looking for. And then we have sprite sheets. Now these are similar to flip books, but the main difference between them is that a flipbook, like we talked about, is a sequence of frames that we use as an animation. And a sprite sheet is any arrangement of multiple frames within the texture. This can help us break up the shape 
adding variation that feels organic or believable. Good effects really boil down to creating something that just looks like it belongs in the world that it's in. And our eyes are really good at picking up patterns. So if we see the same visual repeated too often, our eyes will pick up on it, recognizing the pattern, which breaks the illusion. So how are textures made? Uh, well, here at VFX Apprentice, most of our textures are hand painted. And we have some fantastic lessons over on the website that go into detail about that process. We cover things like painting those single image textures, flip books, sprite sheets like we talked about, and much, much more. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. Hand painting isn't the only way to create textures, though. We can use programs like Substance Designer to create textures procedurally. These kinds of textures are made using nodes, which are sort of like building blocks of information that we can adjust and stack in order to generate our image. If you're interested in learning more about how to create textures this way, again, we have some great lessons on our website, which breaks down the whole process in a really easy to learn way. So next up is meshes. What are meshes? What the heck are meshes? Well, meshes uh, are another building block for visual effects. These are three dimensional objects that we can place our textures on. For example, we can think of a map of the earth and when we apply the 2D image of that map to a 3D sphere, we get a globe. Our image is wrapping around the shape of our mesh. And meshes for VFX work much the same way, except that we have some more control over them. We can have them move across the surface of those shapes in really interesting ways. Now, we don't always use meshes for every single effect, but they can be very powerful to give a sense of, of depth to our effect. Some of the more commonly used meshes for effects are things like spheres or cylinders. These provide um, that, that canvas that we can apply a texture onto that really starts to bring the texture out from this flat uh, two-dimensional space and give it some depth in all, all three dimensions. Sometimes we use custom mesh shapes to give that extra volume and dimension to the effects. And some common ones might be spirals or stretched out semicircles. We can use these to make swipes or slashes, shock waves, just about anything that we need to push the effect away from feeling flat and instead give it some dimension and depth that makes it interesting. UV mapping might be something you've heard of before, uh, but if not, that's okay. Essentially, it's the way two-dimensional coordinates are translated into three-dimensional coordinates. And I know that sounds complicated, but it's really just how we wrap our images over the mesh shape. So for a mesh, like a, a sphere or really any kind of shape, you'll have um, you know, your X, Y, and Z coordinates. This is left and right, forward and back, and up and down. But in the two-dimensional space, you really just have left, right, and up and down with no depth axis in there. So how these get translated between the two are the UVs. And we can manipulate them to create some interesting types of uh, visuals to apply onto our canvas or the, the mesh itself. So in VFX, we can use a variety of different meshes to really start to shape out our composition of the effect using everything from super simple shapes like spheres and cones and cylinders all the way up to highly customized and unique type meshes in order to fit a particular task. Another mesh type that's worth mentioning here and is quite common for VFX is the quad. Uh, now, a quad is a square shape that has a little diagonal line running through it. And that's because it's actually two triangles that are uh, pieced together in order to form a square. They're the default shape for many, if not all, particle editors. And because they're square, their ratio for the UVs is a, a one to one. So if you were to apply your texture onto a quad, it's going to represent that in a one-to-one -one space. 
just as it is uh, when you're viewing it in any other format. And another interesting thing about default quads is that they're camera facing by default. So no matter where you rotate or move within the, uh, the game scene, uh, they will always face directly at the camera, unless you tell them otherwise. We could have quads that are arranged in a whole bunch of other facing directions, but by default, they face the camera. And we most commonly call these billboard particles. Uh, I guess because they uh, they face you, they're kind of like billboards that you might see on the sides of the road. That's just what they're they're collectively called, billboard particles. So those are some of the more commonly used mesh types. And to create them, uh, there's a variety of different programs out that we can use, things like Maya or 3ds Max, Blender, just to name a few. And it doesn't really matter as long as you're using a, a system that you're comfortable in, that's really the, the most important aspect because you can find shapes on the internet. You can, you can download plenty of different meshes, but in order to really get the most value out of what you're working with, it's highly advised that you use a program that you can modify or edit if need be. So being able to jump in and change it up slightly can really, really help. For this final segment, let's talk about shaders. So we've talked about textures. They are the pretty pictures that we're using, the visual element that we see first. And we've talked about meshes. They are the canvas that we're applying those pictures onto. And shaders are how we use those images across our canvas, how we manipulate them in order to do a variety of different tasks. Put very simply, a shader is a combination of some visual math that allows us to manipulate our textures in really interesting ways. So you might have heard the terms shaders and materials before and wondered, are they the same? Because they're sort of used in the same phrase within the same breadth. Technically, the shader is the, the math and the logic and the material is our interface, how we use that shader. All right, so how are they made? Well, some shaders are manually created using code. Uh, this used to be the only way to make them. You used to have to be able to code them yourself. And uh, I know some artists who still prefer this method, but it's a little hardcore for me. Uh, most shaders today are put together using a visual node system like the material editor in Unreal, shader graph in, in Unity, and, and much, much more. Um, they, they allow us to visualize all of that math that's happening behind the scenes. All right, so now let's talk about the use cases, how we use shaders for visual effects. There's a, a variety of different ways we can use shaders in our visual effects to accomplish different tasks and create very interesting things. But some of the more uh, commonly used uh, applications uh, include uh, positional movement, uh, scaling, tiling, and changing color over time. We could use the shader to create a distortion effect uh, where it kind of ripples the, the light, kind of bends the light a little bit, much like how you see uh, the air rippling off the, the hood of a hot car on a hot summer day. Another interesting use case is creating erosions or, or dissipations. This allows us to uh, sort of eat away our, our texture in a more interesting way than just fading it out uniformly uh, just off of the opacity. We can tell the part of the texture to start to disappear before a, a different part. And this creates some really interesting movement within our particle. And one more really interesting thing that we could do with a shader is something called vertex offset. Now, the things we've been talking about before with the shaders really deal with the texture themselves, but with vertex offset, we can use the shader to interact with the mesh that we're using. So uh, meshes are created by these little points called vertices. And when they're all together, they create a geometry of the shape and what a vertex offset can do is it can grab those little points that make up 
the shape or the geometry of the mesh and we can start to manipulate it in really interesting ways. So this is a really cool uh, method of creating like a, a water ripple or something that, that looks like it's, uh, it's breaking up and it's not feeling very static. So liquidy and, and, and water type things can really benefit from having a, a vertex offset applied to them. All right, so these are just some of the most common uses for shaders and visual effects, but certainly not the only things that can be done. There's a deep well of possibilities we can draw from when it comes to shaders, and it's really unlocked by the power of math, which I think is pretty beautiful. A visual effect tells a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Shaders are how we tell those stories, and when they're used in concert with good textures and good meshes, they can be really powerful. All right, so to recap, the visual part of visual effects is the combination of textures, meshes, and shaders. Simply put, they work in combination with each other to create what we see in our effect. Now we get to work with them and put them in interesting configurations, which we'll talk about in our next segment where we go over different types of visual effects.